Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon, Issachar, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you will have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and he returned to the table. He said to them, do you know what I have to do, done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. And you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. When he got, had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer, and you will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. On this Monday, Thursday, you know, when I was growing up, it really didn't mean that much to me. I remember reading the foot washing at Story at Church, and. And then we would just quickly move on to communion. And the real focus of Monday Thursday service was that supper. And then, of course, that was followed by the most depressing service of the year on Good Friday. I've often heard people explain that Jesus' foot washing of the disciples' feet is an account of that was transgressive and icky because Feet were so dirty in those times due to the prevalence of walking with sandaled feet. Only servants in those times would suffer the indignity of, of feet washing. I am amused by this explanation because I also hear plenty of people today say that they could never participate in foot washing because it's simply icky or that they have a thing about feet. I'd be remiss if I didn't admit that many people are thinking washing the feet of a stranger or even a friend, it's also kind of intimate. Yes, not only do we frequently cover our feet in public for their own protection, we also know feet are stinky and feet sweat, and so we want to protect them and keep them under cover. Imagine for a second the act of someone gently touching your feet, washing them with water, rubbing them with a dry towel, this act is so unusual that the thought of it makes people feel very uncomfortable. And yet, this is part of the beauty of the act. And so regardless of whether we see it as icky or not, 
This is what Jesus provides us of an example of what it means to put someone else above ourselves, even for just a moment. Disciplining the self in the face of a vision of what the world would be like if we all served each other. So we find Jesus and the disciples at this Last Supper where they are forced to face their fears of this intimacy of this moment. And to back things up just a little bit for us, previously Jesus had been very clear with the disciples what was most important of the commandments when he was asked. And it was, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. And then he continued, and second is a lot like it, he said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The first commandment is, is clear, absolute and unchanging. But as a commentary I read on this points out, the second provides a bit of a loophole, some wiggle room if you like, if, if we do not love ourselves. So as they are gathered around this dinner table, Jesus takes this opportunity to tighten that loop. He says, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. The disciples and Jesus have gathered together for this one last time. If it's a Seder meal, as many believe it was, well, it's likely they have every, it'll be like one they've never attended before. Imagine the elements would be the, remain the same, the lamb and the cups of wine, the bread and the bitter herbs, the sharing of the story of Moses, the plagues and the lamb and God's mighty hand outstretched arm, the focus of any Seder meal. Just as the host of the meal, Jesus is, he leads them through, the, he leads them through this ritual meal. But as he does, he redefines the Passover story by referring to himself. The bread, he says, it's not just matzah, unleavened bread of, of the Jewish people that they ate while they fled from Egypt. It is my body given for you, a sacrifice for your freedom. The wine you drink is not simply a sign of God's provision and life given for the earth, it is my blood poured out for you and for the many, a sign of provision given from my heart. And then comes the moment Jesus washes their feet. How surprised the disciples must be to witness their teacher take off his own outer garment, wrap a towel around his waist, pour water into a basin, and then kneel to wash their feet. It's not like Jesus has ever demanded admiration of any sort of, of, of hero worship from them in the past, but he certainly never demonstrated servant leadership in such a self-deprecating way. Jesus is their teacher and leader. He has authority over those who choose to follow him. By donating the clothing and the persona of a servant, he exhibits a degree of humility that no doubt takes them off guard. If my favorite professor in seminary, someone I admired and respected, suddenly removed a professional blazer and put on an apron, poured water in a pan, knelt down in front of my thong-clad feet and proceeded to wash them, that would kind of freak me out. Someone whom I respected and who has authority over me should not be kneeling down in front of me. One by one, he washes their feet. Peter at first refuses, not because his feet are not dirty, but because Jesus is their Lord, their teacher, the Holy One of God. This moment of intimacy with Jesus, well, it mortifies Peter. It appears that he takes great offense to Jesus even suggesting such a thing. It's almost as if he's saying, it is I who should wash your feet, and yet you want to wash mine? Jesus insists, however, as we heard in the reading, after Peter protests and does so with such grace. On this Monday, Thursday, the day that Jesus gave this new command that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. He was demonstrating to them that just as he had washed their feet, 
they should wash each other's feet because he has set up an example that they should be do as he had done through his act of humility and subsequent explanation jesus makes it clear that anyone who wants to be his disciple has to be willing to be served even by those whom they revere and most importantly they have to be willing to serve one another just as jesus serves them jesus may also be trying to instill the importance of humility he wants to make sure that when he was no longer with his disciples they will not waste valuable time and energy arguing and competing with one another for position as they do in luke's account of the passover supper instead he wants them to focus on carrying on the work he has begun by preaching and baptizing and healing and challenging the status quo. As writer Jan Richardson puts it, and I quote, Holy Thursday draws us to the table in the company of Jesus and the disciples as he begins to speak his final words on this side of dying. The disciples will not understand everything Jesus has to say, will not be able to comprehend fully the import of what he is telling them, but his words will sear themselves into their hearts nonetheless. These are the words that will return to the disciples later in that bewildering time known as after. These are the words that will comfort them and also stir their courage for the path that waits for them still. But for now, they and we at the table. As the night unfolds, we will see the word, the center of Jesus' vocabulary is this. I truly believe is love. The love that Jesus enacts and speaks this night is an extraordinary gift and grace. But as the disciples will hear Jesus say at the table, such a grace is not reserved solely for them. They are to pass the gift along, to enact this word, to live this word, to give flesh to this word in this world. May we, you and me, be brave enough to do so also. Amen.